Well, I want to take the rest of the time that we have this morning and and um, kind of share a personal story with you. Um, we've talked a lot in the past about personal testimonies and how each of us have a testimony. And your testimony, as far as your belief in Christ Jesus, should should be comprised of three parts. First part, here's what I was before I met Jesus. Second part is... Here's when I met Jesus. And the third part is, here's who I am because of Jesus. And and we should practice that. You should write it down sometime and, and practice that and be ready to share it when the Lord gives you the opportunity to share it with someone. We also have testimonies of God's goodness in our lives. And um, just finishing up the uh, Experiencing God study on Wednesday nights, and, and Henry Blackaby, in Experiencing God, uh, calls these times spiritual markers. There's spiritual markers in your life. When you remember, you mark a time when you remember um, how God worked or answered a prayer or worked in your life. And um, I have one of those I want to share with you this morning. Uh, and it illustrates the power of prayer. And uh, I entitled this sermon, A, a Mother's Prayer, because... This is not my prayer. This is my mother's prayer. And, uh, but yet it was a spiritual marker for me because it taught me the importance and, and the power of prayer. And, and to share that with you, I need to give you a little background. And, and uh, last week, I, I preached on uh, that, that, those two little words in the Bible, but God, and, uh, and I talked to you about a, a coal mining disaster in, in Pennsylvania and, and the men that were trapped and and how they had no hope of being rescued unless somebody above rescued them. And uh, with, kind of with that theme and, and the coal mines, because that's, that's where I grew up, that's where a lot of my memories come from, is uh, growing up in the coal fields of southern West Virginia. My dad, uh, Evan L's dad, being underground coal miners. We, we very much grew up in a culture that, uh, for many of you, you would not be familiar with. You're, you're, many of you are familiar with the culture here in Texas. And many of you, you grew up on, on a ranch and, and raising cattle or farming and those kind of things. But Avenel and I grew up in, 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 in the coal fields. And, and when a coal company would come to the state of West Virginia or Kentucky, where many of you went to Wheelwright, Kentucky, on your mission trip, when those coal companies came there in the early 1900s, uh, they, they would build a little town. They would build the houses. Uh, they would build a store. In our little town, there, 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 was a, uh, there, there was a theater and a store and a drug store and uh, the, surrounded by houses that were owned by the coal company. And my dad went there to go to work. And uh, so you rented your house from the coal company. You shopped at the coal company store. As a matter of fact, many of the coal companies didn't pay... Uh, their miners in, in cash or currency, but they paid them in a, in, in, in a method of payment that was referred to as script. And, and this is a $2 script. No, I'm sorry, this is a dollar script uh, from a coal company uh, called a coal and, Ennis Coal and Coke Company. And it was worth a dollar. The only place you could spend the script was at the coal company store. So they paid the men with script rather than money, and that forced them to shop and buy everything at the coal company store. That's the only place you could spend your money was uh, at the coal company store or the drug store. And, and that store was an early Walmart. You know, they, they sold everything. They sold appliances. They, they sold everything. So, so we grew up in that culture with my dad working for a coal company, living in a coal company house, Shopping at the coal company store. And uh, very much like, do we have any country music fans here today? All right, if you are, you're not admitting it. Now you are a little bit. Uh, Loretta Lynn, you got to go back to some old country. Uh, Loretta Lynn sang that song, Coal Miner's Daughter, right? And, uh, and that song, she talked about living at Butcher's Holler. And when I would go to my great-grandparents' grave on Memorial Day, we, we would go right up Butcher's Hollow, right by Loretta Lynn's house. And that was before she was really famous and before they charged money to go to that little house. But it was just a coal camp house sitting on the side of a hill there. 
But uh, another uh, song that takes me back to our childhood, uh, Tennessee Ernie Ford. How many of you remember Tennessee Ernie Ford? And uh, he sang a song called 16 Tons. You remember that? And, and that song, he said, you load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. So he was talking exactly about what I'm telling you about. But see, my dad, my mom and dad raised them five kids on a coal miner's pay and uh, spending all their money at the company store. Many times after working two weeks, my dad didn't make anything because once they charged him for everything we bought at the store, he might have been in the hole for that two weeks as opposed to bringing home any money. And, and I remember when the Kroger's built their new store in our little town. And uh, my mom went to Kroger's and, and she walked the aisles and she saw how much cheaper everything was at Kroger's as appared, compared to the company store. So my mom committed that we were going to go two weeks without charging anything at the company store. So my dad would get a full payday. And she did that, you know, and we ate a lot of squirrel and gravy those two weeks. And, uh, um, but she got us through the two weeks. And then every Saturday, my dad would get paid, my mom would go to Kroger's. And she'd buy her groceries at Kroger's and, and kind of broke the hold of the company store. And the, the coal companies decided they weren't making money on that rent or the houses got to the point requiring a lot of upkeep. And, and they sold the houses to the coal miners. So my mom and dad bought the house that they had been renting from the coal company. But that's the environment. And that's how Avenel and I grew up. And uh, I was the first one in my family on either side, my mom's side or my dad's side, uh, to go to college. And... Uh, because of a small scholarship and, and, and student loans, uh, I went to school at a school called Marshall University. And uh, that was about 60 miles from our home in Huntington, West Virginia. And, and I graduated from Marshall in May of 1970. And, and some of you may remember, in November of 1970, there was a plane crash in Huntington, West Virginia, and the Marshall University football team were all killed coming back from a game with East Carolina Landing on top of the mountain in Huntington, West Virginia, the plane came in too low on a very foggy, rainy night, went into the mountainside, and every football player on Marshall's team, coaches, uh, were all killed. And many of those young men that died, I had been in school with, in class with, and, and, and played basketball with. So I knew many of those young men that died in that plane crash. But just before I graduated in, in, in the Christmas of 1969, Marshall... Uh, let us seniors have the opportunity to, uh, to buy our class rings. And, and boy, I wanted a class ring. And, and uh, my dad said, no way we can afford it. And my mom, who was that dollar stretcher, she could stretch a dollar. My mom said, well, we'll see. We'll see. And, and for that Christmas, the Christmas I was a senior in college, uh, I got my graduation ring. And my, my mom was so proud of that graduation ring and and I got it for Christmas, and then I graduated in May. And uh, shortly thereafter, three, three things happened to me. I, uh, I met my wife, Avenel, and next in December, we will have been married now 48 years. So that was a good thing. I met Avenel just before Avenel and I got married. Uh, going to church one night with my mom and dad, I received Christ and, and got saved and got baptized. That was another good thing. And the third thing that happened to me was I won the lottery. But it wasn't $1.6 billion like it was this past week. It was an opportunity for me to go and serve our country in the military. And uh, if, if you got a low number, you had to go. And if you were like 190 or above, you didn't have to worry. I was number 35. So I got an invitation from the United States government to come and, and join their military forces. And I did, and, and uh, Avenel was working as a nurse at the hospital, and she had just graduated from nursing school, and I picked her up from work one day and had to go to the recruiter's office to sign my papers, and she was in her nursing uniform, and, and she went with me, and uh, so we go in for me to sign my papers, and they see that she's a nurse, and they must have gotten bonuses for recruiting nurses. 
because they forgot all about me and they began to talk to her. And, and then they said, you know, if you guys are thinking about getting married, if you get married, you can come in on the buddy plan and, and we'll keep you all together. And everybody's saying, yeah, that's right. They're telling you a story. But uh, we did that. We got, we got married. We went in the, in the, in the Air Force. And uh, our first assignment, and they did keep us together, was in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, Maxwell Air Force Base, Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, Avenel was working a lot of shift work and weekends being a nurse. And one Saturday she was working. And uh, some of the guys that I worked with, we decided we would go fishing. And uh, we drove about 70 miles from Montgomery, Alabama uh, on a hot summer day. And we fished below the dam where that cold water from the bottom of that lake is coming out. And, and it was kind of swift, and, but it was a hot day. And we, we waded out about waist deep in that water to fish, to cool off. And strange things about fishermen, because I am one. Uh, Do you ever notice the guys fishing from the bank? They want to throw as far out in the middle as they can get. Matter of fact, they'll wade out in the water so they can throw out far. Now, the guys in the boat, they're setting out in the middle, and they want to throw as close to the bank as they can get. Matter of fact, they get caught in the trees and the limbs and the bank. Why is that? I, I have no explanation for that. Uh, but anyway, here we were. We wanted to throw out farther, so we, we waded out in the water. We, we stood out there in that water. We fished for... Four or five hours, started back home, and and uh, all the, on the way back home, I looked down and my ring, my ring was gone. And I thought, well, I probably left it at home. I probably didn't put it on this morning. And I got home and I and I searched the house over, and I couldn't find my ring. And the only thing I could figure was standing out there in that water for that many hours with my hand wet and that water was cold, you know, your finger shrinks and, and my ring had come off in that river. And I had lost my ring. That meant so much to me, but really meant so much to my mom. And uh, I didn't want to call my mom and tell her, but, but I did. And when I told her, I said, Mom, I think I lost my ring in a river. Uh, I could hear the hurt in her voice. But then she said this to me. She said, you know what we're going to do? She said, we're going to pray that God will find your ring. She said, He knows just where it's at. And we're going to pray that God will help us find that ring. And I'm thinking, I, I wish I could tell you, I joined my mom in that prayer and I got down on my knees and prayed every day. <laughs> but I didn't do that. I'm thinking, Mom, that ring's gone. We're not going to find that ring, I lost it in a river 70 miles from where I lived. How could we ever find that ring? You see, from the world's perspective, I had a college education. My mom had a fourth grade education. But from God's perspective, my mom had a Ph.D. You know what that means? Pray hard daily. And my mom began to pray that we would find that ring. Well, I kind of forgot about the ring. And, and probably six to eight weeks went by. And one day our phone rings, and, and I answered, and it's my mom. And this time, rather than being disappointed, uh, there, there's much excitement in her voice. And she says, guess what? And I said, what? She says, I know who has your ring. Now, I'm 70 miles from where I lost that ring. My mom's 400 miles from where we lost that ring. And I'm thinking... How can my mom know who has my ring? And she said, call this man at this number. He has your ring. And, 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 and when I called that man who had found my ring, and, and I keep that ring now, I don't wear it anymore. Uh, I still have it in the box that it came in. But if you looked at this ring, um, this ring has three ways of identifying who this ring belongs to. It has the name of my school, Marshall University. It has the year I graduated, 1970. And it has my initials on the inside, D-R-G. Now, this man found this ring, and when he did... Now, this is before computers, right? This is before the Internet. 
uh, how's he going to find out? He probably doesn't even know where Marshall University's at. But somehow he figured out where Marshall University is at. He got their mailing address. And then he wrote a letter to Marshall University. And he said, I have found a ring. And here's what's on it, 1970. And, and the person's initials is DRG. Now, when Marshall University got that ring, again, they couldn't go on a computer and look this up. But somebody had to go through all the graduates of 1970 and figure out who had the initials of DRG. And they came up with five graduates with the same initials as me. And they wrote everyone a letter and said, somebody in Alabama has found a ring. Here's his name and phone number. If this ring belongs to you, you need to contact that person. So, who got the letter? My mom. My, my address at school was my home address when I lived at home with mom and dad. So that's why my mom got the letter. And my mom knew who had the ring. So I called the guy. Now again, I lost that ring 70 miles from where we live. When I called the guy, he works at the Air Force Base where we're stationed, and he works across the street from my office. To get my ring, all I had to do was walk across the street. <laughs> and when I went to see him, uh, and, and of course I, I asked him the question, you know, I said, where did you find my ring? He said, well, I went fishing. And... Uh, he said, as I was, said, I waded out in the water, and he said, as I was standing there fishing, he said, I looked down, and he said, there was a big boulder rock there, and he said, it kind of had a bowl shape on top. And he said, I saw something shiny uh, down in that bowl on the top of that rock. And he said, when I reached down and got it, he said, it was your ring. And I tried to pay him, and he wouldn't take anything. And I said, you know what? I said, you went to a lot of trouble to help me get my ring back. And you know what he said? He said, I just felt like that ring was special to somebody. who Wouldn't take a penny. And God said to me in that moment, God said, if I can be that involved in your life to find something of material value that means a lot to you, but especially to your mother, God said to me, how much more involved do I want to be in your life in finding lost souls that mean a lot to me? And it was what God used to begin calling me into the ministry. It was the prayer of my mom for a ring. So here we are today. Halloween's coming Wednesday night. Shortly after Halloween comes Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving, Christmas. And after Christmas comes Easter. And those things will come quickly. We know how quickly things move in the holidays. <coughs> Two questions that always come up, especially during Christmas and Easter, is who was this Jesus? And why did He come? And when we ask those two questions, who was He? And why did He come? We get a lot of different answers. You can ask a lot of people those two questions. Who was Jesus? And why did He come? But when you ask those questions, you'll get a lot of different answers, and most of them will be wrong. But let's not ask others. Let's ask Jesus. Let's get the answer directly from the lips of Jesus. Because Jesus answers both of those questions from His own lips. Look up on the screen, John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and my Father are what? One. Who is Jesus? He's God. Amen. And then there was another time when, when Jesus was with the disciples and, and Philip said to him, he said, Lord, show us, show us the Father and we'll believe. And here's what Jesus said to him. Jesus said to him, <coughs> have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? And he wasn't talking about a family resemblance, folks. 
I've had people tell me, as long as you're alive, your dad's still here. You look just like him. That was just a family resemblance. But Jesus said, me, if you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father because I am in fact the Father, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus said, number one, uh, who is He? Who is this Jesus? He's God. He was God in the flesh. He, Jesus made that plain. Jesus Himself said, I and my Father are one. And Jesus said, if you've seen Me, you have seen the Father. So that's who Jesus is. That answers that first question, who is He? The second question is, why did He come? And again, let's ask Jesus. Let's not ask somebody else. Let's find out from Jesus why He said He came. And look at Luke 19.10. For the man has come to what? To seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I have come. This is Jesus talking. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Listen, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I want you to know that the hound of heaven is after you. He's on your trail. He is seeking you. He wants to find you. He wants to save you. He wants to rescue you. So Jesus said, one reason I came, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's kind of what Jesus said to me. If I can seek and save a ring that was lost in the river, why do you not think I can seek and save lost people? who I love and created in my image. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save lost people. But He gave another reason why He came, and that's in John 10.10. 10. The thief, now the thief is the old devil. The thief or the devil does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. The devil's purpose for your life is to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. But Jesus said, this is Jesus talking again, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So who is He? Jesus. He's God. Amen. Why did He come? He came to seek and to save lost people, and He come that we might have life, and not just a routine, normal life, but He came that we might have an abundant life. And we use that little saying, what should our church be about? Well, we need to tell people how to get to heaven, number one, and number two, help those that are on the way to enjoy the trip, the abundant life. And last week when we were looking at those coal miners that were trapped, we used that verse from Psalm 42. It said, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry, the slippery clay, and He set my feet upon a rock. We were down in a horrible pit like those coal miners last week. No way out. But Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And from the portals of heaven, Jesus reaches down His hand. And he says, take my hand, and I'll pull you up out of that pit. And you know what that is when he reaches his hand down to you and me? That's grace. Grace. G-R-A-C-E. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's hand reaching down to save us. And to pull us out of that pit because the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. But God reaches His hand down from heaven and He says, take my hand and I'll lift you up out of that pit and I'll set your feet on a solid foundation and I'll direct your path for the rest of this life and I have an abundant life for you, Jesus said. And you know what? You have the option to either reach up and take His hand or not to reach up and take His hand. But if you do, your hand reaching up to His, we call that faith. When you put your hand in His, when grace meets faith, Jesus can pull you up and save you. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all I trust Him. Grace and faith. What an amazing thing happens when grace meets faith. And... So church, we need to pray fervently for lost people. I have three brothers and a sister. And uh, two of my brothers are saved. My sister's saved. I have one brother, my youngest brother. His name is Gary. And I'm praying that Gary will be saved. And I'm going to share with you some, a story sometime about my oldest brother, Tom, and how he just got saved in the, in the past few years and how that was another answered prayer. But But... But, but I have a brother that I believe is lost. Now, who comes to your mind? 
Who's in your family? Is it kids? Is it grandkids? Is it parents? Is it neighbors? Is it coworkers? Is it friends? Is it students that you believe are lost? And how often do we pray? Like my mom prayed every day for that ring to be found. How often do we pray every day that people we know and love will be saved? And I've told you this before. And it's not a negative statement, so please don't take it that way. But I said at church, and I'm not talking about just this church, at church we spend more time praying to keep saved people out of heaven than we do to keep lost people out of hell. And there's nothing at all wrong with... We are instructed to pray for sick people. And we have a lot of people in our church right now that that's struggling with different health issues and, and Aggie's getting ready to, to face some surgery that, that that's life threatening but life saving at the same time and not sure which way that's going to go we need to be praying for Aggie and and others in our church we prayed for little Savannah this week Carl's granddaughter and and Gar and I believe God did a miraculous thing there in answer to those prayers but but we need to pray for people that are hurting I'm not saying that but what I'm saying is just as much as we need to pray for people that are hurting physically we need to pray for people that God is seeking and wants to save and we need to pray that his spirit would draw Drawn to this church, and they would hear the message of the gospel, and 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 Jesus would find them, and they would be saved, and then be introduced to the abundant life. We need to pray. We need to pray for lost people. This Wednesday night, we're going to begin to have a, a time of prayer here in the sanctuary, and and we're going to do that from seven to eight in conjunction with the Bible study. This week, we're going to introduce a prayer part, and then the next week. Now, this, this Wednesday night is Halloween. And I know people are reluctant to get out and drive and do things on Halloween night because of all that's going on. But if you can be here, come join us as we kick off a prayer time on Wednesday nights. The Bible says, if we ask anything according to His will, then He hears us. And it says, He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So when we pray for lost people, we are praying in accordance to God's will because He's not willing that any die lost. And He wants to seek and save lost people. I mean, that's why He came. Amen? That's what He said. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And, and He wants to find unsaved people and He wants them to be saved. Now let me ask you something. What have you lost that Jesus could help you find? What have you lost in your life that Jesus could help you find? <coughs> David prayed in Psalm 51 because of the sin in his life, asking God to forgive him. David prayed and he said, God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He didn't say my salvation, but he said, God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You might be here this morning and you might be saved, but you've lost the joy. You don't have the joy of your salvation that God wants you to have. And you need to pray as David prayed. Lord, <coughs> restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You may not be experiencing that. Jesus said He came to give us life, an abundant life. And you might not be, in, you might not be enjoying what you would think is an abundant life. And you want God to help you find that. Uh, as a church, you've lost your pastor. You're praying for a new pastor. And I want to share these two verses with you again. I've shared them with you before. But God has promised you a pastor. Look at Jeremiah 3.15. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. So when you pray, God, send us a pastor, you're asking something that's in complete agreement with His promise. He has promised you He will give you a shepherd according to your heart. No, according to whose heart? His heart. That's the pastor you want. The one according to God's heart. And God says, when I send you my pastor that I have in my heart, then he will feed you. He will feed you as sheep with knowledge and with understanding. Look at the next verse, Jeremiah 23, 4. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. So again, God has promised you a pastor, and we need to be praying, God send us that pastor after your heart, not after our heart. And so, we're going to gather on Wednesday night, and we're going to pray 
We're going to pray for people in our congregation and people that we know that are hurting and, and maybe hurting physically, maybe hurting financially, maybe hurting emotionally, maybe having family problems. We're going to pray for those folks, but we're also going to pray for lost people that we know. And we're going to pray that God's Spirit will convict them and draw them and Jesus will seek them and, and, and find them. And we're, and we're going to pray for our church and we're going to pray that God will send the right pastor. And we're going to pray that, that God will send the workers that we need to do His business here. And we're going to pray that God's going to provide financially to meet the needs and to pay to support a pastor and his family. We're going to come together every Wednesday night and we're going to seek God and pray for those things. And you might be thinking, and the old devil may be whispering in your ear right now some reasons why... Uh, you you shouldn't you, you don't need to come to a prayer meeting, and I, I, I churches all over the country today have eliminated a weekly prayer meeting, and they can give you a lot of reasons why they don't meet and pray anymore, and there's a lot of books written on how to do church today, and some of those books are entitled How to Be a 21st Century Church, and how you need to do things differently because if you don't, you'll die and you won't draw anybody. Let me tell you something. You want this church to die? Just quit praying. Just quit praying, and it'll be dead. If you have no communication with God, don't you think that He's going to bless our church? And, and the devil may be telling you, well, I, I really, I'm uncomfortable coming to prayer meeting because I, I'm not comfortable praying out loud. And maybe you'll call on me to pray. Listen, I will not call on anybody to pray openly unless I know and have talked to you and know that you're comfortable doing that. I will not put you on the spot. So don't let the devil use that excuse for you not to come. Some people say, well, we tried it before and it didn't work. Uh, I only have one response to that. Prayer always works. It always works. Now, if you tried it and it didn't work, then you need, that. you need to take a good, strong look at your prayer life. God always listens to His people when we pray in accordance to His Word. So, I can't buy into that. It doesn't work. That's where the power is at, is in prayer. Look at this last verse and we'll be done. Acts 2.42 And I've told you this before. If I can leave you with anything as your interim pastor, I'll leave you with this. I don't care what a 21st century church looks like. I want the church to be a 1st century church. I want the church to be a church like the church in the book of Acts. And here's what they did. They continued what? Steadfastly. They were steadfast. They were steady in what? In the apostles' doctrine, that's the Word of God. In fellowship, in breaking of bread, that's communion like we just did. And in what? Prayers. And they saw 3,000 people get saved in one day. And that doesn't count the women and the children. Because they did that. And they did it steadfastly. And they didn't have church houses. They met in, in their own houses. And they met together and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And the devil come against them and he tried everywhere in the world to stop them. And at one point they said of these disciples and these people, these crazy guys have turned the world upside down. They really didn't turn it upside down. They was trying to turn it right side up because the world was already upside down. And it is today. Amen? That's pretty weak, guys. <laughs> we need to pray. We're going to do that on Wednesday nights. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in His name, He will be here in our midst. So I don't know how many will show up, but I pray you will. And I pray we will, we will seek God for the things that we have lost. And He will find them. Especially people we love that are lost. Would you stand with me? Father, we, uh, we bow before You. And Lord, even though we'll have a business meeting tonight, this is not our church. Lord, this is Your church. And You said You would build Your church. And you said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Jesus, we read the Scripture. You said personally 
that you had come to seek and to save that which is lost. And Lord, you said you have come to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Lord, those are your words, not mine. Those are your words, not words somebody else wrote somewhere. Jesus, that's what you said. So Lord, that's what we want to be as a church. Lord, we want to help you seek and to save lost people. Lord, we want, to, we want to be used of you to build your church. Lord, we want to be used of you to do like the disciples did in the book of Acts. And Lord, that's to be steadfast in studying the Bible, in loving each other, in, in taking communion, the Lord's Supper, and in praying together. Lord, help us to be that church. And if we are, Lord, look out, because you'll fill this place up to running over. Because you're good at seeking and saving lost people. And we want to be a part of that. So Lord, draw people now as only you can by your Spirit. Lord, whatever the needs are, would you do that? And we have a moment of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.